Hello, hello, hello. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. Getting ready to go live uh, on radio show Zero Today with Dr. Lorenzo Neal. So um, give me all, everyone time to uh, come in. Please come in. Join. Uh, join, join, join. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, uh, this video is being live on Facebook, but it will be uploaded to YouTube. So I want to invite you to subscribe, uh, like the video, and subscribe uh, to my YouTube page and uh, follow One us. One minute until showtime. Got a minute to go before we go live. Uh, got an interesting topic that I want to talk about today. Thank you all for joining. Appreciate you so much. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Happy Wednesday to all of you. Um, I hope that you've read the description of what we're going to be talking about. It is Black Heritage Month, Black History Month, whatever you want to call it. But uh, we will be having an interesting discussion. So uh, invite you to uh, stay with us, share this video, invite your friends to come in and watch and tune in. Also on blogtalkradio.com slash zero today we're live. We will be live there in a few seconds. So uh, tune in, please tune in, please tune in, share, uh, like, follow, all of that good stuff. Hey, cuz, good afternoon to you. Thank you uh, for tuning in. Um, about to go live in about 30 seconds. Your show will go live oh. in five seconds. <laughs> five Four, seconds. Three, two, one. Long Talk Radio. He's a man who's going to tell you like it is. You can never be afraid of something that you don't know about. Now that's ignorance. And for us, ignorance is not bliss. He's a man who's not afraid to talk about the real issues and not skate around it. Don't you think it's about time that you got right, tired right, right. of where you are? I mean, you have got to be ready for God to do something for you and let him move. He's a man who loves his God, his country, and his people. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not too fond of the political state of the world, and particularly the U.S. as it is right now. But if you want change, you have to make it happen. You can't keep selling for less than what you ought to have. He's a man who's sowing seeds of life, love, and liberation to anybody who's willing to hear. There comes the point in time where everybody just needs to shut their mouth up and listen to God. And God is the one who will lead us, and God is not true. He'll tell us everything we need. That covers every area, every facet, from politics to church to you name it. God's got it covered. He's a man that seeks the heart of God for the people of God. You're listening to Zero the Day. Pastor Lorenzo Neal. Good morning, good morning, and welcome. Happy Wednesday. This is Dr. Lorenzo Neal, hailing from Cajun Land, USA, here to present you a words of wisdom, empowerment, liberation, and insight. We're promoting a knowledge that is engaging and transforming, and we're helping you who are listening to us. We're helping you to be empowered to uh, live and impact the world around you in those ways. Always, you're welcome to join us on this illuminating journey. Uh, we are live on Facebook in the state before. I uh, want you to like, uh, like the Facebook live, join in, share this video. Also, we're live on Blog Talk Radio. Go there and listen to archive shows all the way back to 2010. We've been doing this broadcast for 2010 and just started doing live so we, we get used to trying to get used to this uh new format also follow us on all our social media uh i'm on twitter at lorenzo t neal uh and show handle is at twitter uh twitter handle the show twitter handle is at zero radio uh you can hit us up there also visit the facebook page zero network uh, Lorenzo Neal's Zero Network. You could go there. We live there also. So we appreciate all your support. Uh, again, if you're watching on YouTube, and this video has been uploaded to YouTube. YouTube, I want you to hit the like button and subscribe. Follow. We're trying to build up all subscribers, and I thank all of you for uh, listening and following us. Also, you can support us. Uh, PayPal. Uh, you have the information for the PayPal in the description there. PayPal me, uh, Lorenzo Neal. And also on Patreon, you can support us there. 
patreon.com slash Lorenzo T. Neal. So thank you all for tuning in. I, it's a hot topic that I want to talk about this morning. It is Black Heritage Month, and I am glad to be black. I know some are identifying as African American, and I know some who are identifying as American descendants of slaves. That's a new one I just learned not, not too long ago. However you choose to identify, that's fine and good. Um, we are celebrating our heritage. We are celebrating our ancestors. We're celebrating the ones who brought us, who got us where we are. We are where we are because of their lives, their, their sacrifices, their deaths. And while we're focusing mostly on the first, those who did first, you know, the first African-American this, the first African-American that, that's nice. That's all wonderful and everything. But um, we mustn't forget uh, there were more people who were never first. There were a whole lot of people who never did anything. Some never went past the third grade education and yet became successful in our communities. We have to remember them. We have to remember those slaves who purchased their freedom. <laughs> and, you know, they worked their way to freedom. We have to remember them. We have to remember those who were never slaves, those who, who were free, those free blacks uh, who, who were successful. We got to remember all of them. We can't just uh, diminish who and what we celebrate during this month. And I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I do want to talk about that. Uh, before we get into this broadcast, there are a couple of things I do really want to address and um, I, I think it's very pertinent uh, for us to address in regards to the idea of the country being divided and the country is being divided there's, there's so much going on but um, you know regarding um, who we are as, as, a, as a country we mustn't forget uh, as as pluralistic as we are that there's a lot that everyone has to offer in this country and everyone has the opportunity to have success, find success in this country. But there's a lot going on, particularly in uh, the church arena. Um, we just learned in the Southern Baptist Convention that there were at least 700 reports of sexual misconduct in, in some, some degree. I don't like using the word sexual assault because, again, it, it, case by case, you have to go by there. But sexual inappropriate conduct by clergy or members of the Southern Baptist Convention has come to light, and they're suffering for, from it. Uh, you know, since 2005 with this outbreak with the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and what they experienced when it came down to the child molestation, and we're seeing still... We're still seeing remnants of that happening, even in the states like Mississippi, where where we uh, the diocese here just acknowledged that there had been sexual misappropriation uh, regarding children and young adults. All that it, it's sad, and we every Christian uh, Reformation has been affected by this uh, sexual misconduct, and it's it's a sad thing. And just recently, there uh, there's a story that's broken out, and I believe it's in South Carolina, uh, with a pastor who engaged in an uh, inappropriate relationship with a teenager, a minor teenager, and got the child pregnant and uh, made the child have an abortion. And uh, upon his arrest, he admitted to having inappropriate relations with the child for a number of years. <laughs> And that is very sad. It's very sad. Our churches are supposed to be a place of refuge. And I know you're probably wondering how did I get off on that subject. I, <laughs> what does that have to do with my leading statement about <laughs> the greatness of this country? Uh, from the perspective of a pastor, I think that uh, the church makes this, this uh, is one component that makes our country great. The fact that, you know, uh, those persons, those Western, those English persons, those those people who came from from um, from Europe, came seeking religious freedom, establishing different ways of uh, accomplishing that, and which we which we built our society on, you know. So there is a, some Christian foundations to that, 
our founding fathers integrated concepts of Judo Judo Christianity into our um, our construct. They they did that in the D, it's in the DNA of our country, and we got to you know. So I said all that to say that the church plays a major role in how we identify as a country, as the United States. And yes, politicians have played on that in various ways and means. And to see now how the church, how it's being uncovered, you know, layers are being uh, removed. So we're seeing the soul of the church exposed in so many ways. So we, we're seeing how, you know, uh, it's really affecting the lives of people and it's I, I i i'm praying for repentance on all of us clergy who have been involved in some way who have contributed to this either being complicit in uh, our awareness and in action or in our commit committal of said uh said uh, and, and fringes and um uh, you know no one is immune to it uh, you know, we're, we're called to live a life of piety and holiness and sanctification uh, as instructed in scripture, and we should strive for perfection, uh, strive for holiness, and yet we still wrestle. We still wrestle with being human, and uh, for too long, I believe, the church has, uh, has neglected the fact that our humanity sometimes becomes overwhelming. And when we don't deal with the fact that we're humans, subject to uh, failings of the flesh, as uh, the author in First John writes, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life, then we we find ourselves culpable in in uh, misappropriating our uh, sexual indulgence. And um, I'm trying to sound all deep and every profound and everything, <laughs> but. Um, uh, I I pray for uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, those pastors, those affiliated congregations who are experiencing that and wrestling with this this idea of the hurt, the church hurt that has been inflicted upon those who have been impacted by sexual misconduct of clergy and staff or members. It, it saddens us. It saddens us, and we should all be saddened. And it should all drive us. Especially during this this time of love, <laughs> it should drive us to have a heart and a love for the people. To know that even those who committed the acts are still worthy of God's grace and worthy of our love and deserving of justice. The victims are deserving of justice, and those who committed acts. Uh, are also deserving of justice, whatever that justice uh, should be. Anyway, uh, so pray for, pray for our church, pray for the church university. And uh, if you know, and if you know of any clergy person, if you know of any person um, who is committing these acts, report it. It's okay. It's you know, it might hurt them. It might damage the reputation of the church for a little while, but it passes. But it has to happen. If if you know, don't, don't be doing something just because, you know, you want to make sure that it is credible, you know. And for those who are victims and you're crying out, please support the victims. Support the victims, you know. Um, support them in, in prayer and action. So that's my little uh, thing. I didn't intend to stay that long on that. I want to acknowledge the fact that uh, this month, as we celebrate and observe our heritage, uh, two prominent persons of African descent were born uh, tomorrow, actually, celebrating today. That is the person of uh, the right Reverend Richard Allen, who is the founder and first elected and consecrated bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And uh, Frederick Douglass, the famous abolitionist who uh, who was a friend of President Lincoln, an advisor to President Lincoln, a wonderful orator and statesman. You know, so we we wanted not. Hey, Eric, man, 
Glad you're tuning in, bro. I hope you're doing well. Um, again, um, when I think about these two men and how they have impacted my vision of myself as a clergy person and as a, an engaged person, both in uh, the spiritual arena, the secular arena, and the political arena. I don't like calling myself uh, an activist. Uh, I'm just engaged. As a matter of fact, I like the way um, we just had our Founders Day celebration here uh, in the 8th Episcopal District, uh, and we had two phenomenal uh, giants in African Methodism, the Right Reverend um, uh, Bishop John R. Bryant, uh, and uh, Dr. Dennis Dickerson, who is professor of history, uh, endowed chair professor of history at Vanderbilt University. And both of them uh, presented uh, ours, ourself, uh, our, our communion, our Reformation, the Abbey Church, in profound ways. Uh, Dr. Dis Dickerson, in uh, recounting the story of Richard Allen as he walked out of St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church in 1787. He and all the others who followed him, uh, while that was the first social protest in America, the first true revolution, it, and it wasn't even America, it was just in college. The states hadn't even been established yet, you know, as, as, a, as a United States, you know. He led these black persons of African descent he led them out of a church where they were facing racial discrimination. And while he acted on the fact that they were facing racial discrimination, he being a true Wesleyan said that it was not simply because they were facing racial discrimination, but it was because they weren't being good Methodists. Uh, he, he had the idea of not just spiritual holiness, but social holiness as presented. Uh, and I wish I had taken more notes, but yeah, this, this is how uh, it was presented by Dr. Dickerson. Richard Allen, uh, by the way, if, if you don't know about Richard Allen, if you don't know about the Wesley movement uh, or Methodism in America, you know, it, it began, it, John and Charles Wesley came to um, the, the colonies in the 1760s and Wesley uh, they you know went through Georgia and tried to do ministry there it was not as successful but they planted the Methodist Church and at the age of 17 in 1777 Richard Allen was converted to Muff to Methodism because it was in an open brush harbor where he heard the preaching of a Methodist preacher and was converted and he took that 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 power of conversion and use that to empower to be empowered and liberated and it led to the conversion of his slave owner who who's who you know even though he was converted decided you know what i ain't gonna free you i'm gonna let you purchase your freedom and think about this richard allen at 17 years old um raised two thousand continental dollars uh, i think that's the correct figure he raised that much money to purchase his freedom and his brother's freedom. Now think about that. This black man working from dusk to dawn, or from dawn to dusk, and then laboring afterwards, purchased his own freedom. That's phenomenal. That's just phenomenal. And used that liberation, that freedom. He used that freedom to understand his role as not just a preacher, but also as an engaged person, as an engaged human who said, my concern is not just about my plight, my freedom, but my concern is about the freedom of others. The social holiness is not just for me to be pious in my own self, but to be to, to express that piety in the world around me so that all can fully be engaged in the love and liberating power of God through Jesus Christ. And when you think about that, when you think about that, and that same engagement led him to found the Free African Society 
at that mutual aid society bene uh, benefiting all the blacks in that area and the founding of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, not because he wanted to distinguish them as being people, not only because he wanted to distinguish them as being people of African descent, but to also say that we who are part of this African Methodist Episcopal Church will be doing church the white way, the right way, not the white way. We will do it the right way. We will engage in spiritual holiness, piety, and service to the Lord, serving this present age, our calling to fulfill, but we also will engage in social holiness. It led them to be active and serve during the 1793 yellow fever breakout and, and, and other things. And it led him to fight for his church. It, you think about this. Uh, many of you may not, not have, you may know of Richard Allen, but what you don't know about the African Methodist Episcopal Church, while it was started in 1787, and while Richard Allen bought the uh, the old blacksmith shop, and and uh, as his trade was a blacksmith, one of his trades, he had multiple streams of income. One of his trades is blacksmith, and that became uh, Mother Bethel AME Church in, in its present location. Uh, in Philadelphia, he used all that he had to fight for his church when the white preachers were refusing to let him and other preachers preach. They were uh, they were trying to, they were literally litigated. He sued. <laughs> he went to court. It took a long time, but eventually he won the case. He had to pay money. I think it was about $10,000 that he had to pay to get all settled and leading up to what we now enjoy as African Methodism, the first organized denomination of blacks. And it's just phenomenal and remarkable that he did that. And we see, we saw it spread with the uh, beginning of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. And then later on, various uh, apostolic and Pentecostal bodies that were founded by blacks in the Zeusa movement in 1906, led by uh, uh, William Seymour, a black man, and leading to Charles H. Mason, who uh, engaged in that movement later, uh, who had founded uh, the Church of God in Christ, but made it a major Pentecostal denomination. Uh, and so we salute them. We salute them and, uh, and their work and what they did. And I, I just mentioned Charles Mason and I mentioned um, all the others because of their broad relationship with all of us. You know, we, we, if you are black in some degree, you've been impacted by, <laughs> by, by them. You know, and that's not including the independent black churches that were founded, like Alpha Street Black Baptist Church, where uh, founded also in the uh, uh, 18th century, and uh, many, many other that we can name that goes. You know, that are still serving the present age uh, in church. Um, now, I also want to talk about Frederick Douglass, the great uh, orator. Uh, statesman, um, the fact that he, and I have a copy of his book, if you don't have a copy of his autobiography, either one, you need to go get uh, get a copy and, uh, and read it um, because it's empowering and it should help him enable you to understand the plight that he faced and many others like him faced during that time and what he overcame to become the orator the white haired man, <laughs> Afro man that we see today, you know, and I've, I've been privileged to be a part of uh, the Frederick Douglass Foundation, um, as well as the Douglass Leadership Institute. And I want to um, send a shout out to uh, Dean Nelson, who serves as the chair of that organization and the leading, uh, the, the, the leadership that Douglas provided during a very, very turbulent time in this country. You know, being an abolitionist, a black man speaking out against slavery, having once been a slave and having shown how 
the impact of slavery on his physical person as well as his mental um how how that shaped him and um to know that you know his descendants are still around today and they're they're still doing what he was doing they're still advocating for for us you know for us to have this I, this realization that we matter we we matter black lives matter not just when one is shot by a police officer <laughs> or any other our lives matter altogether and um frederick douglas the statesman stood out not because of uh what he did but it's because of who he was in the midst of what he did yeah he he stood out because he did not settle for just being a free man he didn't settle for gaining his freedom he was intent on making sure that all persons who was in who were in the same state as he was had the same ability to be free like him and i think that component is missing in in our liberation preaching our liberation uh writing or whatever we have today is missing that component is missing we shouldn't just be celebrating black heritage because it's the month to do so we should be doing it year round we sh this should be something that is ingrained in our mind to say look we are more than a few pictures 28 days out the year we are more than that we are a people who have gone through so much and yet there's a strain of our identity that remains. So that's what I want to get into. That's what I want to talk about. You know, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you right now. I don't believe Black History Month is, um, is authentic anymore. By that, I mean, I don't believe we really celebrate it. I, I believe, honestly, I believe that the majority has allocated to us who we ought to identify with. They whitewashed our heritage. They whitewashed our history. There's a story on, uh, on the Christian Post where a there was a white substitute teacher, I believe is in North Carolina, who made the statement, and this is crazy. She made the statement that Martin Luther King Jr was not assassinated that he committed suicide and then went even further to tell these uh, majority of black students in their class that true Christians supported Trump <laughs> and that those young men who were in her class the way that they were dressing uh, marked them for prison now I read that article and, and you can find it on black Christian news also you can go there you read that. Uh, I, I, I read that article and I was beyond angry. I was beyond, well, I won't say angry. Mostly I was uh, discouraged by the fact that there's, there's a, a remnant who still have that idea that, that, that uh, black liberationists, including Dr. Martin Luther King, I consider him as a black liberationist. I don't care, uh, you know, yeah, he made the, the speech, I have a dream, and, and yes, he fought for integration and, and against segregation. He was a black liberationist at heart, along the veins, you know, even though he and Malcolm X uh, had different uh, means, they were in the same vein. They wanted liberation for blacks. And I get discouraged when I hear people talking about reparations now. Look, I'll be honest with you, you we, I know black folk. We get reparations, we gonna spend money. We're not gonna invest. There's a presidential candidate right now who was talking about, uh, you know, if she were elected, there'd be, she designated a hundred billion dollars over 10 years for reparations for black people. But the reality is we don't need reparations. We need empowerment. We need, we need empowerment. We need, we don't need resources given to us. We just need to tap into the resources that we already have and build on that. And 
And I know there's some hotep brothers who like woke brothers and all woke sisters and saying that we ought to do that. Uh, I I think we ought to. Hey, along this 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 frame refrain of black identity. So I came across I mentioned earlier uh, a new term called African descendants of slaves, and this term has been you know, I've been watching too much YouTube, but this term has come up. Uh, in a lot of uh, YouTube vloggers, largely because of uh, presidential cam uh, candidate Kamala Harris, I think I'm saying her name right, Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris, uh, Cory Booker, and um, and they're you know the fact that they're they're questioning what makes a person black, you know what is what defines blackness in and. and for example, you know, we, we were defining Obama as black instead of biracial. And, and, and you know, he was really Kenyan American. You know, uh, he's African American. He's true African American. His father was from Africa. He's Kenyan African American. That's how he really is, you know. But we were calling him black because we needed this, this sense of a unified block, a unified stock, a blackness to identify. And at one time there was such, there was a such, there was a thing that was a seemingly center, uh, singular identifying block for blacks. Black folk went to church. <laughs> Black folk ate soul food. <laughs> uh, uh, Black folk went to church in their Sunday best. You know, uh, those were some identifying qualities, uh, characteristics of what we knew black folk to be, you know, back in the day. We, uh, the vernacular, what is now called, um, what what we now call Ebonics. Well, I don't even know if they call it Ebonics anymore. anymore. I know when I was in high school, uh, it was, that was, it was emerging language. Ebonics was emerging language. They were introducing the black vernacular as a construct of English speak. So so those who spoke broken English could now be stated as saying, well, they're speaking, uh, they're speaking their language, they're speaking their vernacular, they're speaking Ebonics. And once it got mainstreamed, you know, we started seeing it and you know it became, in my opinion, this is just me, it became more offensive the more it was used by us black folk because we had to identify uh but in anyway i digress the idea uh the idea that there was a singular identity a singular identifying thing for black it used to be uh i, I know when i was coming up at at the onset of the burgeoning hip-hop movement you know you're really black if you lips listen to rap that that was one thing that determined that was you you were black, you know, uh, in the fifties, forties, thirties, it was jazz. You listen to cats like Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, you know, Coltrane, um, Duke Ellis, you know, you, you listen to those cats. That was black music, and, and uh, that was identifying a black. The other thing was you know. Blacks were basically skilled uh, in, in industry that was not, uh, let me put it this way. We were able to do stuff that most white wouldn't do. So we were skilled when it came to music. We were skilled when it came to our hands. And we were definitely skilled when it came to sports, and even though we had to have our own leagues to do so. We had to. Negro leagues. It was necessary. We had um, schools, the A uh, HBCUs, that were necessary, and that was an identifier. I'm, I got to blow my nose there. Excuse me. This, this weather here is, is getting the best of me. Those were identify. I mean, you were truly black if you went to a school like Howard. You were truly black if you went to the school uh, a school like where I went to. A.M. and N. College, now the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, you know, uh, and and when it came to music, you know, you were 
that was just a certain thing that you did, you know, that identified you as being black. And now those those lines are blurred. You know, I, I, I didn't watch the Grammys. I haven't watched the Grammys in a very long time. But I was reading an article um, not long ago, a couple of days ago, uh, in which uh, it, uh, there's this gospel artist, and I don't know her name. Uh, but anyway, she recorded with Kurt Franklin, and she won the Grammy, as I understand it. She won the Grammy for Best Gospel or something like nature. Uh, you can find that story on uh, Miss Ann Brock's, Ann Brock's page, The Old Black Church. I, it's on there. You can go there. That's the reference if you'd like to find the story about uh, what it was is it's saying that Smokey, uh, Pastor Smokey Norfolk was kind of throwing some shade at the Grammys because those were true gospel artists uh, who were nominated did not win. And this person who is not melanated <laughs> won, <laughs> won the gospel. Uh, and, and again, you know, I get, the gospel music was once identified solely as black before we got into what we see um, today, you know, with uh, folks like uh, uh, Israel Houghton and um, Dietrich Haddon, who experimented uh, with music, and Kurt Franklin, who was, you know, they they experimented, they brand, they broaden our uh, our understanding of how gospel music could be. You know, back in the day, Ron Cannoli, <laughs> Ron Cannoli didn't know he didn't fit in anything. If you know who Ron Cannoli was, Ron Cannoli was this. Uh, black person who sing and uh he's singing uh he recorded a lot of lot of early uh praising worship songs back in the day in the late 80s and 90s right but he didn't really fit into black gospel music like james cleveland or reverend james moore or the williams brothers they, he didn't fit in that group and, and, and but he fit in with those who identified as christian that's and that's a whole different thing, but anyway, uh, so the 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 idea of what defines and what gives identity to blackness is really being challenged today. Who and what defines our black identity? Now, to be honest with you, I know that if if I were to walk into some place where there's not a high black population. If, if persons of non-melanated skin were to see me, the likelihood of the, a positive inter interaction would be uh, medium to low. You know, they might be intimidated <laughs> if I'm not dressed appropriately. You know, if, you know, they'll see me in my tie, like now, if I walk out in a public square <laughs> where there's a lot of white folk, they would be less intimidated by me because I have on a tie. A shirt and tie, so I look professional. But if I go in there, and I, you know, I got a sweatshirt on, a hoodie on, or something like that, and you know, I might not be sagging, but if my jeans might, you know, be a little baggy, <laughs> you know, the interaction would probably be, <laughs> you know, not as positive, <laughs> not as positive. And my black skin, the color of my skin, my melanated skin would serve full purposely to identify me with blackness. And, you know, that would be it. But within our culture, within the black culture, you know, the diaspora of the black culture, we, you know, we have the melanated brothers and sisters, and we have the lightly melanated brother and sister, you know, the yellow bones, red bones. Y'all know we have those. And they're more receptive of persons of that higher melanin, I mean, lower melanin than, uh, than those of us who are higher melanated. And when it comes to culture, we've become so, I love the fact that we have become mainstream. I love the fact that, you know, 20, 20 years ago, hip hop, uh, blah, 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 hip hop, <laughs> hip hop was still relegated to the urban centers of the country. And, and while it was relegated to the urban center, the, the, the consumers were not always black. 
you know, they weren't always black. You know, that's how they got the major record deals and major record sales, because black folk we were listening or we were dubbing. Uh, you know, we were file sharing before file sharing was. <laughs> Hey man, you got that cassette? Let me hey, let me dub that cassette cuz I can't afford I don't want to pay for it. Let me let me copy it. <laughs> don't act like y'all didn't do it cuz most of us did. <laughs> um but as it broadened and as the, you know, I think about white uh rappers who pre Eminem, you know, the white rappers uh who came in and had their little hits and we all danced to the same music and and you see the same dance in the hip hop culture. Uh, think about Breaking, the the two movies, Beat Street and Breaking, that, that kind of the brought in uh, the mainstream America to the hip hop culture, the breaking, you know, break dancing and all that. And you saw those different crews who were integrated. And so you had blacks and whites and Hispanics and uh, all in a group and Asian Americans all in a group popping and locking and breaking and and you had you, you did have your your black uh, uh, groups doing the same thing but that opened it up to you know to a, a, a divergence of what we understood as black culture and so now it's it's kind of been uh, diluted a bit and with that diluting, what we're finding now is an identity crisis. Who are we as black folk? Who are we as black folk? We can't really singularly identify with the black church because, again, even with the with the black church, we're moving, trying to be um, multi-ethnic. We want we have people in our churches who, who no longer really identify singularly as African American, black, or anything like that. You know. They they consider they're a little bit they're a little a little more uh, freer in their thinking. We have uh, persons who who no longer identify with the church at all. They're atheists. They're non-believers. You know, or uh, they're secularists, humanists, and and they're finding a broader voice outside of the black church. They're finding a a broader jo broader voice for their social justice outside of the constraints and confines of the black church. Uh, and and we're, we have this, I, I learned this term recently called swirling. And I'm still, I, I, I think I understand what the concept is, but I'm not sure. Swirling, you know, you have a black man with a white woman or, or a black woman with a white man or uh, a man outside of their race or a woman outside of their race is called swirling, as I understand it. And it seems that's becoming a little more, a uh, little more prominent in our in our communities. You know, I can't argue that. But the, the thing about it is, there's this again, this this true identity crisis uh, that the that Black America is, is facing. Who are we? We know that they're going to pander to us for whatever it's politically uh economically they're going to pander to us but us don't know who us is the majority of us who if you want to identify as as a american descendant of a slave or slaves uh if you want if you're choosing to identify that uh how far can you chase trace your roots how far back can you go in your ancestry, how about without uh, doing ancestry.com, without doing that, what is the oral traditions of your family? Do you know them? Can you can you recall stories that your grandparents or your great grandparents or their parents share with them? Can you recall that? Is there some source for your identity? In your in your within your familial identity, you know your immediate family. Is there some source for your community identity? How did it, how did your community come out? I grew up in a community called Booker T in Monroe, Louisiana. All right? And Booker T is the hood. <laughs> I just happen to be one of the good nerds out of Booker T. <laughs> but I understood that the more I, I learned about my community, the more I learned about some of the names of people who like the foster homes. And, you know, I, 
I ain't even get into that. But some of some of the names, some of the community members, our elders and our ancestors, we got to interact with who were in their eighties. By the time we were in, you know, when when we were coming up, I. I, I interacted with a lot of them, and I, I gained and I gleaned from them, and I, you know, I'm grateful that in my in my life, in my family, we have a wonderful uh, family history, both maternal and paternal. Uh, they have gone through the task of understanding who they are, knowing who they are, knowing their family history. So I can go back at least four generations on my maternal side and at least three or four generations on my paternal side. And I know the struggles that they faced. And my maternal and paternal uh, families have two different origins. And it's just amazing to me that, that I'm a part of such, such a diverse and somewhat eclectic family origin. And I'm glad that my ancestors were who they were because I have a solid identity of who I am. And every time I go home, that is reinforced because I know, I know, I know. I have a sense of knowing, even from the, the very educational sense, you know. I, I'm glad that my parents went to Monroe Colored High School. My grandparents went to Monroe Colored High School that later became my high school, you know, Carroll High School. I'm, I'm empowered to know about that. Uh, the elementary school that most of my, my comrades went to, you know, my friends went to, uh, and, and I didn't realize this, but, you know, we were still under forced busing and desegregation as I was in elementary and in and, and high, actually, probably still going on now, but we were enforced, we were still under that forced uh, desegregation order. And so it was funny. Some of us went to a predominantly uh, uh, a mixed interracial elementary school. Some went to a predominantly black school. And even though my middle school, my junior high and high school were predominantly black, you know, the few, the few whites who did come there, they weren't too far out of place. But before then, you know, under the mandated desegregation, there were blacks who were being forced, you know, bused to the white, predominantly white school. And now that predominantly, that predominantly white school is now predominantly black. Um, and, you know, we have a, back home, they had a two, two uh, separate school districts, a parish and a city school district. And it was, it became so because of uh, racism, discrimination. So they formed their own stuff. And that's just, I mean, that's how it was historically. So when you understand, because I understand all of that, I have a greater sense of identity. You know, because I'm in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, I, I, I have a greater sense of identity as far as, you know, who I am as a black preacher in the AME Church. I, I know uh, what I am to be preaching. I know the strains of within I'm supposed to be preaching in the likes of Richard Allen and James Cone and, and Cecil Cone and Black Liberation. I understand that and I do and I appreciate it and I, and I do so vigorously because I want to be empowering to those who serve me, serve the Lord and who I serve as pastor. I want to be empowering to them. And that's a way of doing that. Um, but it goes back to this to this identity crisis. For example, you know, the uh, recent incident with a celebrity who claimed to have been attacked by uh, non-persons of color wearing MAGA hats, Make America Great Again hats, and and um, he identifies as black and homosexual. And so that was a, that was a drawing point. You know, that was a hate crime and now it's seeming to be not the case. But he, he, he drew upon that identity and immediately, uh, in so many ways, you know, demanded our support. And we have, you know, when it, when it comes to black men in particular, we, 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 we struggle like, okay, what does it mean to be a black man? What, what does that mean? What should a black man look like? Is the black man the athlete? who is, you know, making millions of dollars, and once they decide to do a protest that goes against 
what some people to believe to be patriotic loses their career? Is that a black man? Is the black man like those men, those sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee, when Dr. King went there to uh, advocate on their behalf and eventually led to the, his martyrdom, his assassination? Those black men walked around with signs on their chest saying, I am a man. Because they knew their identity was, 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 was being infringed upon. They were seen less than. Because they were seen less than, it was expected. Some of some in the larger community expected less than of them. But they knew who they were. They knew their value. They knew what they were supposed to have and who they were. Their identity was great. They and so they marched. And they demanded to be recognized as such. Today, I, I don't believe we have that solid identity as black men. When it came to black women, we knew black women to be strong having in the times of slavery pre-abolition pre-emancipation having to have forcefully have children there was no abortion they were forced they were raped some of them and if they weren't raped if they had children with someone that they they gave their love to for eternity, even though it was not recognized legally, and they pledged their love to one another, and they were separated, their families were separated. And I always wondered about this, I, you know, like, well, how can we have families with the same name in the same area and not be related? Then I thought about, oh, I know how now. Think about those men who were separated from their wives, from their baby mamas. And I, I don't use that term in the context like what is used today. But these men pledged their love to these women who they were slaves and they were not legally recognized to be able to have said love. They were property. And yet, even in spite of being seen as property, they saw themselves as humans capable of having the same thing that their white masters had. Even when their white masters violated them, both male and female, forcing some of the black men, you know, to do terrible things to their black wives, forcing some of the black wives to bear children by them. And the black women survived. And, and now we, you know, we're, excuse me, in this, uh, this culture of abortion on demand, where in the black community, unfortunately, and yes, I'm talking on it because it's part of our identity crisis, you know, uh, where in a, unfortunately, uh, black women are choosing to have abortions and it grieves me when they do that, even though I personally have contributed to that problem, like many other black men probably have, uh, you know, they, 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 they still have this sense of identity that empowered them that led them to endure all that they endured. And today, you know, I it, I won't say it, it does grieve me. And I know that there's there are people who are trying to find their identity. You know, what makes blackness black? And I think about <laughs> I think about this movie with Chris Rock and uh uh what's the other guy? Uh, CB4 is the name of the movie. Uh, but anyway, in the movie, you know, Chris Rock is an affluent young black man who likes to rap or wants to rap. And so in order to uh, gain notoriety and record deal, he, he takes upon this imagery of uh, a gangster rapper, CB4, and he steals the identity of the real guy, whatever. But anyway... In the midst of that, you know, as they part, there's the one scene, um, I think his name is Payne, I, I don't, you know, the, the fair-skinned brother. And, you know, he's, he becomes the militant black because that was the thing back in the 90s, you know, the late 80s, early 90s. You got to be pro-black. And his song was, I'm black, y'all, and I'm black, y'all, and I'm blinkity, blinkity, blink, black, y'all, or something like that. <laughs> something like that. It was funny. That, don't ask me. My mind goes there every now and then. But, <laughs> and, 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 and the, oh, the other thing was this, um, most 
of our elected officials up until recent history, most of our uh, political leaders were fair skinned. Most of them were because they used their, their fair skin to get access to power. And later that trickled down into, you know, darker brothers and sisters getting in there. But for the most part, the fair skins had a, a great, they had one leg up on darker skinned brothers. Not always the case. Richard Allen, uh, as mentioned before, was a darker skin, but you know, he made his own thing. So I digress. But I said all that to say, we're wrestling with this idea of blackness. And this is me. For me, blackness, my my blackness is 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 found in in, in again black in my heritage, my ancestry, of course, you know, it's in my DNA, my DNA, but also now in the community I live with. I live in is urban communities, majority black, you know. You hear the gunshots, you hear, you see the drug addicts roaming the streets. And for some, that's what identifies as black. Unfortunately, I don't think, I, I don't see that as black. I see that as sickness and sin and something that needs to be addressed holistically, uh, both spiritually, uh, emotionally, you know, psychologically. I see it all of that. But for some people, that's, that's the only way that they identify as black. For young black men, uh, the way they identify as black is by uh, not being monogamous, you know, by by engaging in risky behaviors, in, on in all sense of it, sexually, uh, financially, in, you know, all of that. So the more risk they take, the 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 blacker they be, believe themselves to be, and it's rather unfortunate. And likewise with our young sisters, it's the same thing. Um, the idea that they must give themselves away freely as a way of identifying as black or, you know, be promiscuous or engage again, like the young black men, engage in risky behaviors, be it sexually, uh, be financially, uh, changing the image. Uh, I don't have a problem with we when it's one, you know, when it's done right. <laughs> But unfortunately, you know, we have sister Walker. We have sisters walking around here with red, pink, purple, blue hair. Come on now, we gotta do better than that. We have we have persons of color who really don't know who they are, and they're trying to find a core for their identity, and we're not presenting it to them. Uh, the majority is presenting that to them. The majority is saying this is what blackness is. Blackness, according to them, is this way. You know, you, you, you're you black when you dress this way. You're black when you behave this way. If you're overly intelligent, if you're too intelligent, you're not black enough. If you're too educated, you're not black enough. You know, you lost your black. And I don't get, you know, I don't get this, you know, black card, you know, who when we start giving people black you know we inviting them to a barbecue you know they can come to the cookout because they can identify as black uh, <laughs> it's funny but we we sell our shell ourselves short when we do that or uh disowning black folk who think independently of the entirety of what we think to be collective black thought now i ain't gonna lie to you there's some brothers and sisters that i i i i would question <laughs> I would question their heritage or their 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 um, understanding of their heritage by the way they you know speak against some of the things they do, uh, and I'm not talking about those who have a more conservative uh, identification because in some ways I I do that. I'm talking about those who blatantly I mean blatantly will sell us out. They they would rather stick to one side of uh, the paradigm of blackness, which is uh, constructed by the majority and they rather fit into that construct construct than to say look I identify as this and though I may be a little more conservative though I may be a little more wealthier though I may be wealthier uh, though I may be educated more and all you know privy to uh, a little more access to power uh, 
I still identify with this, this core identity of blackness. And I think we gotta get back to that. And I think there are a lot of persons who are, who are engaged enough to help us do that. You know, I don't, I don't believe that many who are being promoted in contemporary American culture as such are those. And you can take it however you want to. I don't believe many of those who are being promoted by the majority are the ones that we need to. Seconds. That are, are the ones that we should say are the uh, primary carriers of black identity. And it's sad that it's the case. And, and again, black has never been monolithic in America. Black has never been monolithic. Shouldn't be. And that's what I love about it. You know, there's no uh, monolithic black religious experience. Even though we have caricatures of such, you know, what the black church is like. And believe me, I've been to plenty of churches that, that uh, properly describe that caricature. You know, I, I like getting my shot on every now and then. I like watching mothers with their church hats on. I, you know, I like hearing the choir, uh, you know, rock and sway to a good old fashioned uh, gospel song. And, you know, <laughs> those characters, I, I love a good a good preacher, a good black Baptist preacher, a coach preacher, a AME preacher that can, that can, that knows how to, Mm, tune it on up uh, and, and get it on out. <laughs> I love that, you know, the character caricatures of black preaching. I, I, I love that. However, that does not uh, monolithically define our identity. And that's the wonderful thing. Ten so uh, I said all that to say that we are in an identity crisis and majority, the majority knows that. They know that we have no centralized identity. That's why they're able to manipulate us to vote the way we vote. That's why they're able to manipulate us to get on agendas that are not beneficial to our communities. That's why they're able to uh, keep us economically disempowered because they know that we don't have a central core identity. But when we did, when we did, we did. Even as a collective, you know, uh, even even though we've never been a monolithic collective, but as a collective within each other, uh, you know, within our strength, we, we found our strength and we did what we needed to do. That's why we have the Morris Browns. That's why we have the Philander Smiths, the, uh, the Morehouse. And the many, many other black colleges that we have, the Hamptons, universities, all those schools that, that were built on the black, uh, uh, the black collective identity that this is a necessity for us. Even if we got to start it in one school, one house school, you know, one room schoolhouse, this is a necessity for us. And I believe that we can, we can embrace our diversity. I believe that diversity would be good for us. And I don't believe, you know, I, I hate that we're still trying to find this collective unifying person. We ain't going to have a Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't want to be Martin Luther King Jr. But what we do need to have is a collective identity based on our shared heritage. Yeah, we might still have first. There's still first being happening. Just uh, recently, I believe in North Carolina, we had the first uh, appointed uh, Supreme Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice, or something like that. I can't think. I can't remember. But you know, you can find the story there. We're still making breakthroughs. We still have uh, a wonderful hope. We have a, a brother, eleven year old, who's at Southern University. I mean, highly intelligent, doing for. We have. Young, young black women who are empowering themselves and going into business, becoming entrepreneurs, you know, selling lemonade, making millions. And we, we do still have our Oprah's, who is the black billionaire. We have them. We have uh, uh, our Byron Allen, Byron Allen, y'all know who I'm talking about. <laughs> He's a black billionaire, you know, with, with the, the entertainment conglomerates. We have our actors like the Zell and, and many, many, many others. We have that. And that's wonderful. That is wonderful. And we should build off that. We have a collective identity. We, 
and you know we can use that collective core identity to be empowering for us i believe that's where we are i think this is a wonderful time to do that and it may not the church may not be the the, the mode of that happening and that's fine if the church is not the mode of that happening that's fine however it happens we should be in embracing it you know we should be not we should not be letting the majority define who we are and how we ought to be because if they define us we'll be back where we were 200 years ago if we let them define us if we let them provide to us the identity that they think we should have we'll be back where we were 200 years ago we don't need to do that we don't need to do that anyway uh i've i've ran it enough listen i want to appreciate uh express my appreciation to all of you who are tuning in thank you for tuning in um uh again continue to support us um all you can you can support us on patreon uh lorenzo t neal paypal me lorenzo neal uh and that information is all there uh if you catch this video share it like it uh i don't see all the comments and maybe i missed them but anyway it's uh this video will be uploaded to youtube uploaded to youtube so you can uh Go to my YouTube page here today with Dr. Lorenzo Neal and um, look through the videos there and like them, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I appreciate you for sharing with me uh, your afternoon. You guys have a wonderful day and the Lord be with you.